Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and today we are looking at another election that is also happening in conjunction with the municipal election on October 18th, and that is the Senate elections of Alberta. Today we are sitting down with our first candidate who has put his name forward for the Senate elections here in Alberta, and that is Dr. S uh, Sunil Sukram. Uh, Sunil, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity to share uh, where I'm coming from and hopefully introduce myself to Albertans. Thank you very uh much. Hey, no, no worries. Um, my first question for any candidate who has put their name forward in uh, political office is, where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, that's a good question. And um, I, I had a chance to review some of your other interviews. And so that is the first question that everyone uh, was asked. And so <laughs> I had some a chance to do some research and think about it a bit. And that's, that's honestly where I, I, I approach these challenging situations to, to sit down and think. So I think uh, my uh, um, desire to serve comes from some of my life experiences and the unique uh, immigrant experience that I've, I've had to date. I'm a little older, and so uh, um, I, I came to Canada when I was six years old, right? Um, um, we, I was born in Guyana, South America, and we left there when I was two, and my father went to school in England, and I was along for the ride. And, um, and we went through the struggles of, uh, of a racialized uh, family in England at that time, and the economy wasn't great. My, my parents didn't have much, but they, 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 they struggled through it. And I learned about hard work. I learned about sacrifice. I learned about what it takes to, to just get it on, you know, and get, get through it. We had the fortunate uh, opportunity to move to Canada from England when I was six. And so uh, I was raised in Scarborough, Ontario. Uh, you're from there as well? I'm from, an, uh, I'm from Ontario, but I know Scarborough quite well. I'm from yeah. the Oshawa area. My oh, mother's okay. actually here visiting from the area right now. So <laughs> I'm, I'm proud to represent Ontario here for a bit. Yeah. And so I, I, I grew up in Scarborough and uh, things were tough earlier on. You know, you, uh, uh, my, my family struggled. My dad worked double shifts and, and then my brother and my sister came along. They were born in Canada and I learned um, um, how to work hard. You know, I saw my role models, my father and my mother work super hard to get us the opportunities uh, to uh, to succeed. And my 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 parents did OK. Eventually, they they uh, accumulated and they lived the Canadian dream and they really set up my brother, my sister and I. And I was the oldest to follow in that stead. And you got to really appreciate that because a lot of Canadians go through that, uh, both uh, immigrants as well as those that are born here, the struggle to get there. And um, and um, uh, my father, uh, although an electrical engineer, he uh, uh, evolved into being a faith based leader. Um, uh, we're Hindu. And so he was a, uh, a Hindu priest, just like his father was, just like his father was uh, when they came over from India to Guyana back in the 1800s. And so I learned um, about service through watching my mom and him get involved in the church. I learned uh, what it took. They volunteered tons of time and energy to the uh, to the Indo-Caribbean community of Toronto, which you know is quite large, right? Yep. The the, um, the Indian diaspora that moved from India to the Caribbean, and then many moved up to Canada. There are more Guyanese in Toronto, New York than in Guyana, they say. <laughs> Um, uh, but, uh, but that's what I was immersed in while growing up. And then the immigrant, the, the immigrant experience was challenging. You know, I got to give it to my parents who sacrificed a lot to get to this, uh, this place. And uh, I was long for the ride. And so when I came to Canada, uh, with little, and we were able to get to where we are now, I, I learned to appreciate the experience. I learned to appreciate the opportunities. I got the opportunity to study and succeed in life. I mean, here I am at age 50, uh, as uh, I, I would say, and maybe others would say as well, that I'm an accomplished physician, a leader within the healthcare system. I, um, I got a chance to succeed and uh, fill my career and life dreams, honestly. I have three kids, um, a wonderful wife, living in a house in Edmonton, how, opportunity to travel around the world because I have the resources to do that. And we've been to 62 countries. 
or I've been to 62 countries to date. And so an opportunity to give something back. And I started giving back earlier in my life, right? So I, um, I, I've now spent 30 years in the military. I retired back in 2018 as a reservist. Um, I got involved very quickly as uh, in the healthcare world. So I started off as a medic in the army and then became a healthcare administrator, took my commission and then became a physician within the military. And, um, and I really appreciated those kind of opportunities to, to look after our soldiers in different places around the world. I, I did tours, uh, deployments. I was in Bosnia in 2002 and during the Afghan war, I had uh, the privilege of looking after our, are, um, are wounded uh, as part of the what we call the critical care air medical evacuation team. So I used to go to Germany, pick up our wounded soldiers that had been wounded in Afghanistan and taken to Germany, and then bring them back to Canada uh, as safely as possible using a variety of airframes of convenience. I, I even got to use the Prime Minister's jet on occasion. Oh. <laughs> you know you get served in government of Canada, China? When you're in those kind of opportunities. <laughs> but um, I got to do that, and I really appreciated that. I continue to give um, with um, healthcare delivery at the tertiary quaternary care center of Alberta. So I look after, or I'm part of the team that looks after the sickest people in Northern Alberta, Northern Saskatchewan, Northern BC, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, right? We don't have the golden hour. We have the bronze day um, for people to get to Edmonton from so far away. And so I, I've been able to give there. I've been able to um, serve Albertans through organizations like STARS. I'm one of the STARS flight physicians. I'm, I've been a trauma team leader at the university hospital since uh, 1998. So looking after the sickest uh, uh, people there. I, so, so to I'm interrupt a, sorry, you go here, ahead, go because ahead, go ahead. I, I got to ask, because the, your resume, and I, I've done some of my research on you, as any good reporter or journalist or host would do, and I've read your bio on your website, and the first thing I honestly thought to myself was, this guy has done a lot in his life. Why would he want to give it up and go serve in Ottawa? Because people say government moves at a snail pace, and you've decided that uh, I, I've done everything that I can do in my life, in the military, in health. I want to go serve uh, Albertans in a different way now in Ottawa. Why? A, what, what, uh, what was the decision behind that? Because that just seems like a very radical change from what you're doing now. No, I think that's a good, uh, good question, Chris. I, um, I've done a lot. I agree with you. And I would like another challenge, right? I know how to do my jobs really well, I think. And, and so why not take some of that technical expertise take some of that passion and redirect it in an area that I'm, I'm not familiar with. I'm not political. I'll share you with, that with you, that I, I don't know this space, right? And in order to prepare myself for some way to contribute nationally, which is what I aspired to do about five to 10 years ago, to give something back to Canada, um, uh, where would I best fit in? I don't want to do the politics games. I don't want to run for election and have to have to be partisan, right? I, I like trying to solve problems. I like collaborating with people. Uh, I love sharing my wisdom and my experiences to help Canadians. And so where, where did I see that fit in? I thought the Senate would fit well. And, uh, and um, there's a lot of wise people there. And I think I can contribute at that level. That's where my energies might be best served because I, uh, um, I have a lot in common with the, the sober second thought uh, red chamber, right? Um, versus the, 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 the um, my ideology is centrist. I'm happy to listen. I'm happy to collaborate. I'm happy to share my perspectives to come up with solutions that benefit Canadians, right? And this is where I think um, I might be best served. I mean, I studied politics when I was in university. I studied uh, um, uh, civics in grade 13. I don't know if you remember grade 13, do you? OAC. <laughs> yep. I did OAC politics, right? Yep. And I got 99% in that. <laughs> I loved, I love that stuff. I love that space. And I, and, you know, like when I went into medicine, everyone told me I couldn't do it. And I thought, upon further reflection that at least I should try and I was successful. 
here's another challenge. Uh, people have told me, oh, you should, you can't do this. This is a um, um, racialized kid from Scarborough doesn't get to the Senate, right? I, you don't have connections to politics. You don't know Trudeau. You don't know any of the things that will allow you. you you're, you're not a bag man for one of the politicians, right? You don't belong to any party. You can't get there. So uh, upon reflection and thinking and talking to my wife, um, we, we thought, you know, if I don't try, I have to live with that regret for the rest of my life. And so I tried. And, and to be quite clear and, and transparent, I tried through the process that existed until March, right? So I, I did my MBA uh, back in um, for the last 16 months. I finished in, uh, in uh, February of last year because I didn't understand the business space that well. And I didn't understand economics because it was a part of my world I didn't have to do before. So I went out and filled those gaps, right? Um, and then as part of the thought that I would get, I would apply to the Senate at some point. So I applied back in November of 2020 using the the current process up until March. And and we can talk about the, dis, the dispute about that in time. Um, but um, back in November, I applied to the independent Senate appointment process that every Canadian can is eligible to do. And uh, I put in my application. And I have not heard anything yet. Uh, in March, Alberta passed the Alberta Senate Elections Act, which um, I, I, are we going to discuss a bit of that? We, I, I we, think we will discuss that a little bit later in the show, but yeah. I, I still yeah. want to focus in on you for a bit because you just mentioned something that gives my head a shake because I, I think I'm busy with everything I'm doing, but you're a trauma doctor in Edmonton, one of the busiest hospitals in all of Northern Alberta and probably Northern BC, Northern Saskatchewan, none of it in uh, Northwest Territories. And then you decide, you know what, that's not enough for me. I want to take my MBA as well during a global pandemic. Just before the pandemic. I, I finished it before the pandemic. Okay. okay. <laughs> I was sitting here going, okay, what do you do for a hobby? Like you, you seem like you're always going and you're always challenging yourself. I, I, I am. Wanna, I, I want to talk about this election. On your website, which is sunilsukram.ca, which will be linked in the show notes. So for my listeners and to my viewers, please click on it because you want to check out because this is an important election as well. In the opening paragraph of your website, you say, as a senator focused on partisanship, not on partisanship, but the real diverse needs of Albertans today. I'm going to ask this question, and I think a, you are probably well prepared for this question, but what are the diverse needs of Albertans today? You know, we look at the news and my family would say the same thing. My, my, my parents and my brother and my sister, they mock this stereotype of what they think Alberta is, right? This, um, the redneck oil and gas worker, um, uh, the person that has stuff, you know, the ATV, the boat and all that stuff. And I think there's an element of Alberta that has that, but the vast majority of Albertans are hardworking people that just are trying to get by, you know, try to live the Canadian dream. And we are fed through the current media, this image of this fight between Albertans and the national government. We are fed um, um, ideology of this right wing ideology. But I think Albertans aren't all right wing. There is an element of Alberta that's right wing that values the um, the independent free spirit. I mean, that, that's, that's there. And, and the current ideologies that we, that, that stereotype Alberta is out there. But I think the vast majority of us want to try and find solutions to real problems, right? The, uh, the, um, how our economy is, is struggling right now because of the drop in oil and gas. So how do we move forwards, right? How do we deal with climate change? How do we deal with the mental health crisis that is happening around Alberta. And I live that, right? Um, I, 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 just to share, so just to give you some perspective of this, COVID is bad. I'm not doubting COVID is bad. I've lived it for the last little bit, but we have had more people suffer from mental health challenges, opioid, crystal meth addictions than, than COVID deaths in this time period. And so these are real problems that need to find solutions. And 
I think Albertans want to hear about those things. Albertans want solutions to those kind of things. And I think I'm well positioned to be part of the solution versus getting caught up in the ideology uh, fights, which troubles me, honestly, right? Um, uh, the, all we see in the news is, you know, Trudeau versus Kenny. And I'm sure both of them have their, their important points that they want to bring forward. But I would really like to see them working together to find solutions. <laughs> and I think other Albertans would think so too. So how do you envision doing that in, and I'm using your words here, and I think it's the words that every politician uses when they're talking about the Senate, but how do you envision working with all Albertans while in Senate as that second sober thought? Because not a lot of people, and I, I, I would say not a lot of people, and these are, I'm, I'm generalizing here, know exactly what the Senate does. And it is a uh, institution that is set up through the British monarchy that, <coughs> sorry, that is supposed to look at bills that the House of Commons passes and send them back and say, okay, you need to do this over again, or you need, need to make it a little bit better, uh, aka sober second thought. We found a different way to look at it. How do you envision yourself working for the betterment of all of Canada, but also still advocating for those diverse needs that Albertans need and want? That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, but you bring up exactly what the Senate's role is. It's a constitutionally mandated institution that um, has regional proportional representation. And Alberta has six seats, right? Two seats are available right now, but they've just recently appointed uh, uh, Senator Sorensen a couple of weeks ago. Um, actually, there's only one seat available right now. Senator Black has just announced his retirement uh, coming October 31st. So there'll be two seats that are up, to, up for play in this election. The, the role of the Senate is to get, is to allow while majority rule prevails in the House of Commons, the Senate allows minority rights to come into play and be, be brought into perspective as these, these legislation and policy pieces that are created by the governing party, which are often fraught with ideology and politics, uh, allows uh, them to be thought of a little bit longer and hopefully mitigated to lessen the impact upon all Canadians. Right. And that's where wise people, people that are technically uh, have some technical expertise, people that are a little bit older and have some life experiences, people that understand um, um, uh, that have some knowledge. Right. Can bring these to bear versus the political side that the House of Commons brings. And the governing party is entitled to to uh, bring forward legislation. Right. That's that's what they elected to. But the Senate allows um, through independence, because since 2016, it's gotten away from that world of patronage and partisanship to be an independent body. And, and we've now had five years of a whole bunch of new senators, mostly independent, um, be allowed to bring that independence to bear. They're not going to hold up legislation that the government is gonna be brought forward. The perfect example is the MAID legislation that went through recently, right? And I'd love to spend some time talking about MAID if you have time. As and I was gonna talk about some of those issues that the Senate is dealing with right now and dealt yeah. with who, where the sober second thought did come into play. Yeah, um, and, but continue and they're not gonna hold up. Court. Yeah, they're not gonna hold up this legislation, but they'll provide some substantive feedback that'll allow the legislation to be better and create a framework that will benefit all Canadians versus a subset, right? We are in a very partisan time, just like the Americans, right? And I think what Obama and what uh, Biden have said over and over again on their election night uh, is important. We, we have blue states, we have red states, but we should be the United States, right? We need to find a nice catchphrase for Canada. We have gotten to this very partisan time, which disappoints me, honestly, right? I would like to us to be better than that. I would love the days where you can disagree with someone politically. And this happened before. I, I think Trudeau and Mulroney did it, right? You can disagree politically, but you can sit down and have a beer afterwards, right? I would, I want those days where, where you can disagree politically and then sit down 
hopefully find common solutions, actually listen to the other side. And sometimes they have good ideas and bring them to bear in, in your prospective legislation so that it betters all Canadians. That's what I envision. And I think being a centrist and not being riddled with partisanship and being riddled with ideology allows me to be that person because, um, yeah, I have paid party membership to both party, both major parties, and I voted, I voted for all three parties at some point in my life. Um, I think all of them at certain points in history have have features that attract me. And I think a lot of Canadians think the same way. If we didn't, we'd still have a liberal government in Alberta because it was the very first liberal <laughs> first government of Alberta. And that's how things work. If, if no one changed their minds, we'd still have things in play. We'd have conservatives and federal, Alberta liberals. But I want because, to take a moment. But, but, but historically, we've gone back and forth every five to 10 years throughout all of Canadian history, right? Yeah. And I anticipate us continuing to do that. I, I agree wholeheartedly, but I want to take a moment. I want to, I want to thank you for saying something. We need to start having conversations. And I, I'm glad that as a candidate, someone is saying that because I find that social media and as much as social media can be a double-edged sword, it can be a good thing to get your message out. It has changed the way of how political, uh, how, how politicized things can be, and people just don't want to listen. So the fact that you're out there listening to both sides and everyone and not just listening to your own, and I say tribe, and I don't mean it in a, a bad way, but as a political uh, group, I, I'm glad you're willing to say that because I think today's society, we need more people like you who are willing to talk to everyone and listen to everyone. Because like you said, all sides have good -ish ideas. Let's bring them together and make this country great. So thank you. Thank you. I, I want to talk about policy now because you brought up one that I wasn't going to talk about, but let you, you want to talk about it. So let's talk about MAID for a second. For those who are un uh, un uh, unsure about what MAID it is the medically assisted uh, uh, dying via uh, doctors, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know the exact terminology and the exact name of the bill, but it is basically uh, allowing Canadians the right and will to end their lives at their choosing and not suffer. Uh, as someone who is currently going through some medical issues himself, I have been looking into this issue quite seriously over the next few years, probably, but I want to throw it to you, um, Sunil, and say, the, the Senate threw this back at the House of Commons and said, we need to do better. We, here's how we can do better. Here's how we can do better. How would you have helped move this issue forward? Or was the Senate wrong in changing the way that the wording of the bill that the House of Commons sent to the Senate? So I'm sorry to hear about what you're going through. And, uh, and uh, I hope things work out. But allow me to share which might disappoint or might upset some of your viewers. So this will be a controversial point, right? So, so this, uh, this, will, uh, this unfortunately might uh, take up the bandwidth of this uh, conversation, right? I am a made assessor and a made provider, right? So I understand this. I've lived it since 2016. I've traveled this journey with families that have suffered and individuals that have suffered for the last five years through this. And it is hard, right? It, it, it takes a piece out of me each and every time, but I've been involved in many cases. I understand people exercising their autonomy and I appreciate that, right? Uh, I am the only one, and, and so this is the controversial part because we don't often release that we are this, right? Because it, it elicits- um, A negative stereotype that you're Dr. Death in some sense. Yeah, and that's not the case. I'm. Uh, I think it is a journey that some people choose to take through a process that's been established legislatively. And it's right for some people, it's not right for others. But um, it is what it is. And it, it's a great thing for those that choose to do that. It lessens their suffering significantly. I think uh, I'm the only potential senator there's no one in the Senate that does this. The three people that are playing the leadership roles in this discussion do not do this. They've not lived it, right? And I've gone through the Hansard of all of this discussion because I, I actually spoke to Senator Simon during this 
to try and share with her my, pers my perspective, being a frontline person doing this. I think um, that this will continue to be a, a, um, a topic of evolution as society's values change, right? Uh, what we first started with based upon Carter et al. Um, has, will have, has evolved with the, the, the revisions that occurred in March. How we play this out with the non-foreseeable death, which I've navigated two people through, right? Non-foreseeable death. I'm still struggling personally with how to navigate that from my own personal ethics, but there's a process in place. The Senate was, was pushing, and I agree with some parts, but the process hasn't been clearly laid out now, is how to make this a reality for mental health. And I agree, there are some people with mental health that are suffering and can't be fixed, right? Some schizophrenics, some chronic disease parts that, uh, that we don't have a solution for, but we don't, the current process needs to evolve to meet those people's needs and make sure there's adequate safeguards in place for the right person. It shouldn't be carte blanche for anybody in mental health. I think it, there needs to be a process that's different than it is for the people with foreseeable death. That's probably different for those with non-foreseeable death, right? Uh, we'll need a third track. We're now trying to figure out how the track two works out. And I think I did the first case of track two in Alberta. Um, it was because uh, they, they, once the legislation was, was, um, was passed, the track two people came out and then their 90 days has just lapsed in, in July, right? Um, I, I traveled that journey and I've traveled it uh, in a very emotional way, right? Um, the Senate has been advocating for people through this process. And I think it's been really good. I think Senator Wallen, a conservative, pushed for um, advanced directives, which I think is a possibility for people with Alzheimer's and people with um, dementia to allow them to exercise their autonomy when they, they can't anymore, but don't want to live in that state, right? Uh, how this works out, I don't know. And that's why the committee that is meeting right now, the by, by the, the both the House and Senate Joint Committee is, is navigating through these difficult things, hopefully in an apolitical way. I would love to be on that because I can provide a fresh perspective being there on the front line, which none of the others have. Senator Meiji, who's the chair, and Senator, uh, who, who practices palliative care, has not lived the May journey, right? Uh, neither has Senate, uh, the, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Senator Martin, who's the other Senate co-chair, uh, who opposed the original made uh, legislation, you know, uh, uh, when, it, when it was passed by the Senate uh, back in March. Um, I, I would love to share my perspectives at this level, and, and I think I have a lot to offer here. You, you mentioned something that I want to dive a little bit deeper into here, because sometimes people don't understand what the Senate does and how they go about meeting in committees. And it is sort of a smaller version of the House of Commons. And uh, people like there are subcommittees that meet with senators who look at bills and look at the uh, these type of things like made. You mentioned that you want to sit on health and looking at your resume, looking at your background, you would be the perfect fit for that. It seems like you are like destined if you are elected to be on that committee, but sometimes you don't get to choose. Mm -hmm. Might get health is not a health is not a recognized committee within the Senate. Actually, they have science, technology, and and social sciences, uh, but health, particular health, is a is a uh, is a um, is a provincial issue, right? And so there is no dedicated health one, but, um, but I, I do think, sorry to cut you off. You go ahead, sorry. No, I, and I the reason I asked that, and you sort of were just going to basically answer my question, I think is I've had the pleasure to uh, chat with Senator Black about a few things. I, I chatted with him back as a reporter in Lloyd Minster when I first started out. And I think he was just elected to the Senate at the time. Uh, and he was just appointed to the Senate by Stephen Harper. 
he had a list of things he would love to see changed in the Senate. He had one, two, three things that he wanted to change in the Senate. He wanted them televised. He wanted them to sit more often. He wanted a little bit more uh, transparency around fi uh, like expenses because there was the big expense scandal with the Senate. What are the three things? Would you would you want to advocate for a health committee that senators would sit on to talk about health issues? Because while you are the sober second thought, if there is no subcommittee on actual health related matters, we are losing. I know it's a provincial issue and I, I people who are yelling at the screen right now or listening to this yelling at their car radio. I understand it's a provincial issue, but we need sober second thought on all issues, including health. Would you advocate for a subcommittee on health? I think that um, that is a possibility. I think navigating through the politics of that would be a difficult venture. Uh, but I mean, there is a federal minister of health that provides direction to the provinces on national health issues. And so there's an opportunity to form and, and create national policies that impact us um, uh, at a provincial level. In particular, areas that should be addressed nationally that could be part of this uh, uh, potential health um, um, uh, subcommittee is a national palliative care strategy because our baby boomers are growing older. Our baby boomers, what we call the gray tsunami is here, right? And uh, this, this cohort of people, which is a substantial population of Canada are struggling through chronic disease and struggling through um, um, end of life care issues. And so we don't have an opportunity to give direction, give policy to allow the provinces to have some uniformity to, uh, to these important topics. And I think that that would be one that I would love to be part of and, and help champion. I would love to champion some veterans health issues. Our veterans have suffered. I, I look after them. I, I, I didn't get to this in my preamble, but I still continue to run a clinic at the military base in Edmonton one day a week where I look after our soldiers right, our current soldiers and prepare them for release and veter and becoming veterans outside of the military. Um, they have lived through, and I'm a, I'm a veteran of Bosnia and Afghanistan, but there's been many other conflicts through history, right? Afghanistan has taken a toll on our, our past and present serving military members. Uh, and I look after them now, and they are, they are broken. I, uh, my training is in aviation and diving medicine, so I look after most of the pilots and the air crew. Most of the people that joined the military in the Air Force did not expect to shoot, right? They wanted to fly. And in Afghanistan and Iraq and Mali, they had to shoot. And that has troubled a lot of them. And um, I think we need to have a framework in place to support them ongoing. Uh, we, we need more. We can do better than what we're doing right now. So I would love to be involved in, in, in champion more veterans health issues. COVID has highlighted the struggles of our first responders, our, um, our EMS, our fire, our police, our emergency, our ICU people, they are burnt out. This is not just a partisan issue because uh, the UCP want to cut their salaries. This has been a physically and emotionally tiring process. And I've lived it. Right. I, I intubated five people in one shift once during the height of COVID. And I knew three of them would die alone without their families around them. That takes a piece of you out of you as you as you uh, as you as you go home that day. You know, I'm fortunate. I, I, I live in I work at the U, but I walk home. Right. Because I live right near there. And that is my chance to decompress. So I don't. You know break down in front of my family. <laughs> and so I, uh, I think we need to support these people so they can continue providing the kind of care uh, onwards. And so I might not have um, the same framework as Senator Black, which I agree with all the points that he brought up in interview. I heard it, right? I thought that was very profound and I would agree with all of these things, but I think we need to get into some policy matters that are being left out of the current conversation and they need champions, and I'm prepared to do that. So I would, I, I, I would happily 
And I would happily champion and I'd happily be engaged in MADE, the palliative care strategies nationally, a veterans health strategy nationally, a first responders health. And I appreciate that they're health related. I can do more than just health. I, uh, I'm happy to share with you where I'm at there. Well, um, it- and that's the area that I want to sort of talk about. And I'm sorry to interrupt and I just uh, cautious of time here because I don't want to run late because I know you probably have other things you have to no, do. No, you, you, to... you keep me as long. I've set aside the afternoon. If you want me to take up the afternoon, <laughs> I would. Again, <laughs> uh, well, my mother's here, so I need to deal with my mother as well. <laughs> uh, what I want to talk about if you are the successful candidate and Jason Kenny uh, gives your name to Justin Trudeau to appoint you to the Senate. There is a underlying theme in uh, Alberta that senators should advocate only for Albertan issues, energy. They should be advocating for pipelines to be built across uh, provincial lines. Uh, C-69 being one of them, and the Senate passed Bill C-69, and if I'm not mistaken, one senator from Alberta voted against it and voted for, uh, sorry, voted for it. I want to know how you plan to represent Alberta's interests while also being true to who you are. Because from the 45, 40, 30 minutes of the conversation we've had so far, you seem like a straight shooting guy. You tell it like it is. You're going to tell the people why you vote the way you vote. But at the end of the day, people want someone that they believe will represent Alberta in the Senate. How do you tell people across this province that a vote for you is a vote for the interest of Alberta? Well, constitutionally, you are a representative of Alberta regionally, right? That's that's what the book says or the, the document says. And so I think it's important to represent Alberta at these at the table. And the fortunate thing is that uh there are five other Alberta senators we can discuss find a common strategy to allow us to move forward outside of ideology and politics, right? To, to, do, to be the true statesman versus the politician. Uh, if you read, did you read Plato's Gorgeous at one point in your life? Yeah. So, I mean, I aspire to be a statesman. And, um, and uh, while I think it's important to represent Alberta perspectives, um, um, there is a... a um, a need to uh, to uh, that Alberta is an important part of the nation as a whole, and so you need to represent both. How you balance that requires some thought, requires some judgment, requires true statesmanship, and uh, that that would be my intent to to allow myself and my colleagues to think about it a bit, come up with a common strategy, and hear from Alberta certainly. Seek out their advice, certainly, but also share the, what other Canadians are thinking back to Albertans so they can understand that their perspective, while, while it's, it's, it's valid, it might not be in Canada's best interest on occasion. I think it's a balancing act that uh, will be difficult and will be issue specific. You, you mentioned talking to Albertans, talking to Canadians across the country when you're deciding on issues that could affect uh, livelihoods, that could affect potentially uh, the changes in Canada that might be against what some Canadians believe that is their right. And I, I say C69, I go back to that because it's the only one that's on the top of my head right now, because I literally just did an interview yesterday with someone who just spent about two hours talking about Bill 69. Um, I want to know, at the end of the day, though, you can talk to 10,000 Albertans from the north to the south to the east to the west of this province. You will get 10,000 different opinions on one issue. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you are the person in that chamber voting on the issue. You will have to come back to Alberta and say, this is why I voted for this issue or voted against this issue. How do you plan to be transparent with the people of this province to ensure that they understand why you voted for some some bill over another bill or voted against a bill? Because people want transparency because right now they believe senators go off to Ottawa and you never hear from them again. Well, I think some of my predecessors have done a good job of justifying their decision-making track. I mean, uh, Senator Black has published op-eds 
in uh, in, uh, paper, in in the newspaper, and I would be prepared to do those kind of things. I think uh, you can't just go off to Senate the Senate and 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 not bring back something to Albertans, and and maybe that's an area that I would like to see more of. Right, an opportunity for our all elected, both the Senate and the and our our elected uh, individuals to have a feedback forum, a traveling roadshow, or something back to Albertans to allow them to town halls, exact town halls to uh, to share with them why they're doing what they're doing and hearing from the grassroots uh, what's going on. Right, so that uh, that that I'm committed to doing. I've traveled all around this province. I've gone to high level. I've gone to Fox Creek. <laughs> I've gone down to Waterton, right? It, it's a wonderful province. Uh, um, it's, it's diverse in its perspectives, diverse in its people. Um, and, um, and I think senators need to be part of that, that opportunity to, to feedback. And, and um, Senator Tannis has done things, something similar. Um, the current other senators are in place. I haven't, I haven't heard of them doing similar things, but I think uh, as a caucus of Albertans, we can happily create processes to allow Albertans to know what we're doing. I, I'm just, yet again, I'm looking at the time here and I want to get this question in now because we mentioned it at the beginning of the interview, but I want to get your opinion on it because this election is not binding. Mm -hmm. If you are the successful candidate, if you come out number one and number two, or number two, because like you said, as of October 31st, there will be two Senate seats available. Justin Trudeau does not, the Prime Minister of Canada, or at the time, Aaron O'Toole, but Aaron O'Toole says that he would uh, uh, appoint the people who were the top choices in the, any election. If Justin Trudeau is, uh, wins re-election, he does not have any constitutional obligation to appoint the two uh, top two people or whoever he chooses from the list of the electors to the Senate based on Jason Kenney's recommendation. Why do an election? Why put yourself through this if there's a chance that Justin Trudeau is just going to turn around and say, while you were number one, I can do what I want because the Constitution has laid out the fact that I can appoint who I want? I know. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the reality. Um, this non-binding election troubled me. I, 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 I applied through the independent process, Right. Um, but the reality is nobody in Ottawa knows who I am, right? So this independent committee who aren't as transparent with their selection process, nobody knows what their, what their thoughts are. Kennedy, Kenny and Trudeau had a discussion on July 7th at, uh, at, um, at the Stampede, and they talked about it. Kenny announced on the 15th of July the Senate elections were happening and that Trudeau would consider um, nominating someone to the Senate that was on the slate, but they should also apply through the independent process. I have applied to the independent process. Uh, I'm unsure of what my competitors have done, right? Um, and so I, 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 this is an opportunity for people to get to know who I am. Um, get my name out there because as a honestly i'm a racialized canadian immigrant with no connections to politics no family connections no nothing no one knows who i am so this process allows me to get out there and i'm hoping that my message can be disseminated among all albertans and i thank you for that opportunity honestly and that they would vote for me and my name is on the independent selection committee's radar screen as well. So it would it would be a win-win from Trudeau's standpoint if I am one of the select the, the successful elected people and an applicant as well through their process. Um, it is what it is, unfortunately. And I I um, I, I, I find don't it think frustrating. I've... <laughs> I don't think I've ever been able to ask a Senate senator or a person who wants to be a senator this question. So this is going to be a very unique opportunity for me. So, um, Sunil, why should you be the next senator for the great province of Alberta? 
Well, let's bring it back to Plato's Gorgias, right? Um, um, there's politicians, there's statesmen. I aspire to be a statesman and I have no politics background, right? I, I am bringing a wealth of life experiences, including traveling the world, serving this country, um, um, seeing cultures from all over, being aware of cultures from all over and, and respecting them. I think I'm a fair person. I think I bring technical expertise in a variety of areas that the Senate has standing committees on, including national security and defense, uh, the, the MAID stuff and the legal and constitutional affairs, a diversity, uh, social sciences and technology. And I have a master's degree in aviation medicine. So even transportation, I can, I can bring to bear, right? So I have all of this. I, I am happy to learn and, and, and collaborate with the other side of the aisle, right? And, and share my, uh, and find some common perspectives and hopefully find some solutions in future legislation and policy that'll benefit all Canadians. I think I'm the complete package, honestly, and <laughs> I haven't had an opportunity to share that with Canadians to date, but um, I, 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 this, winning this election and being selected by Albertans would allow um, them to have somebody that can can represent Alberta truly and well. And uh, I think I'm I'm capable and have a desire to do it. But this is politics. And as um, Shane Saskew, who was in uh, Wild Rose MLA at one point, told me as I was searching to deciding to do this with my wife, we met with him uh, surprisingly because he's friends. He's a with good my guy. I, I know him quite well. Oh, he's he's a he's a partner with my lawyer, and my lawyer suggested that uh, I reach out to him. And he said, uh, which was quite profound, that good guys don't win this kind of stuff. You're a good guy, but uh, it's the politics going to get in the way. And so, if I don't try, I have to live with that regret. I'm going to go through the process of trying. I'm hoping I'm successful. I wouldn't be surprised the politics gets in the way, unfortunately, and I hope that it's not too messy to me and my family as we traverse this process. Um, I, um, I think I would love to be a champion for other racialized Canadians uh, and bringing some diversity to the Senate, bringing some, I, I you know, I, I, when I first entered, thought of becoming a senator, I thought I'd be, I'd be the first Indo-Caribbean in the Senate, but unfortunately, the Prime Minister just appointed two of them <laughs> from Ontario. <laughs> so there, I lose that uh, that value proposition right there. And then. But the first one from Alberta. True. In fact, the first racialized Canadian from Alberta, if I'm picked. None of my competitors are of racialized descent. And, and it truly is a reflection of where Alberta has grown in the last 30 years. We are not a white male homogenous population anymore. We have diversity, we have a large gay population, we have a large LGBTQ plus uh, population, we have young, old, um, pro-oil, anti-oil, we have everything. And, um, and uh, it's sad that we're painted with one brush when other Canadians think about Alberta. I'd be that reflection of being somebody that's not of that stereotype. Well, it goes back to that opening statement on your website. Like I said, um, the real diverse needs of Albertans. Um, I, I can say that uh, this election is going to be a sleeper election. You, there is not a lot of information being put out there about the Senate elections. That's why we're doing a full week on the Senate election, uh, lecture, elections, and hopefully the candidates will come and sit down with me. Um, Sunil, this has been wonderful. I, I, I wish you all the best because you seem like a person that politics needs. Politics needs people like yourself who are centrist, who are willing to talk to everyone and not just talk to their own political leanings. And I hope, I hope, I hope Albertans get out and vote. I hope uh, Albertans get out and learn a little bit more about you. And I asked this last question to you is, how can people learn more about you? Where, where are the options that they can reach out if they have a question about your beliefs in the Senate or that we haven't covered in the last 50 minutes? Well, my website um, at sunilsukram.ca has my platform and it'll continue to evolve. Honestly, through this process, talking to people, 
leads you to uh, to uh, to come up with some new ideas, right? So already people have reached out and said, what's my view on TRC, the, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission? And so I've uh, just thought about it a bit and drafted up something. I've reached out to some political people that I know. Um, uh, Raj Sherman and I are meeting tomorrow. Raj, uh-huh. uh, yeah, I don't know if you know Raj. Raj is I don't, my... I want him on the show. If you, oh. if you just say, hey, Chris wants to talk to you. Well, I'm, I'm having, uh, he's been one of my mentors through life. And he, he went through his own trials and tribulations through the political machine, right? Um, uh, so Raj is going to share with me his perspectives on, on a number of things uh, and, and hopefully help form my ideas on some other areas that uh, that'll be more transparent in time. If people want to, um, to uh, I, I'm not allowed to use my AHS email, so I can't give them that <laughs> because of conflict of interest uh, uh, reasons, but um, 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 that's a good idea. I might have to put a comments uh, section on the website so that people can share their ideas. I want to hear from Albertans because that's the important part of being a statesman or a politician, hearing what the grassroots is thinking and saying and then responding accordingly. Um, this will be a difficult process, unfortunately, for me and my family. I, I'm quite certain of it because politics can be messy sometimes, right? And the best person, the best male or female might not always be the successful one. It is what it is. I'll go through this process. It'll be an adventure regardless, honestly. And, um, you know, as I hit the last half of my life, I've become more profound. And um, uh, I just turned 50 this year. And... Um, on your deathbed, you only remember your experiences, not the stuff that you have. So this will be one of the experiences that I'll remember. Whether what, what that deathbed is, I don't know, and I hope it's a far cry from now. But um, hey, if uh, you're elected, you get 25 years in the Senate. There you go. Actually, uh, oh yeah, yeah, 25 because eight seventy five retirement. But you know, as as Senator Black and Tennis have said, fixed election dates might be the way to go. I mean, your life changes over over a period of time so should you waste it your life um i wouldn't say waste should you spend all your life uh, uh there working or should you do your five ten years and get out and enjoy something i don't know these are things that um will have to be thought out in time let's take one step at a time the first step is getting elected and then hopefully getting appointed which uh, you your your process here your your show has been a great value to to helping get my message out there. So I really appreciate uh, your uh, your um, your uh, this conversation. It's been well, uh, I was a little scared honestly because I didn't know what to expect. But uh, you've been a very fair host and very fair interviewer. Well, thank you um, for my listeners and to my viewers. The link to Sunil's uh, website, Facebook page, Twitter are all in the show notes. I will say on his website, because I just checked it out before he was mentioning his email, there is an email address as well up on the website. So if you want to learn more, if you want to get in contact, please reach out to Sunil because this is another election and we need to vote in all elections. Our voices need to be heard and we need to take the time. We need to take the opportunity to get out express our wills, but be educated on why we're voting. And this election, while, like we said, is not binding, it is an election that we need to vote in because these are the people that we could be sending to the upper chamber and we need to send the best people of Alberta. So Neil, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, Good luck, man. I, I wish you all the best in this. I thank you. Uh, Shane said the same thing. He, 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 uh, he said that uh, I'm an excellent candidate just be wary of the politics. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that into consideration, but thank you very much for your opportunity today.